Let us pray. Holy Spirit, please come into this room right now personally and stand here with us. We want to glorify Jesus Christ. It is your work to convince us, to correct us when we have gone wrong, to draw us back to Jesus if we have gone astray, to rebuke us if we need it, to convert us. All this is your work. Man cannot do this. Please come and stand here now. Help us to center all our thoughts on Jesus Christ. We thank you that you heard us and that you're standing here right now. In Christ's powerful name. Amen. God longs for expressions of love from each one of us. Just as you long for expressions of love from your children. I can hardly wait to go home from New York City to New Canaan, Connecticut, and had those six children run out the door and jump up on me and climb up on me. I need that love. I need that encouragement. So does God. He longs for your expressions. But what did it take, God, until we would respond to him, until we would give him this love? Not until he laid down his life would we love him back. Here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. God shows his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, enemies, Christ died for us. His love is the foundation of creation. His love is the foundation of redemption. His love is the basis of education. Before God is anything else, before he just is his love, if he was only just, after man fell into sin, he would have wiped us out. But God is love first. Love is the basis of our obedience to his commandments. Love is the basis of our victories in our lives. Love is the basis of our faith. Behold what manner of love God has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. If we for one split second could just see how precious each one of us is, is in God's eyes, we would marvel and we would be embarrassed. We would say, oh Lord, if I had known how precious little me is in your eyes, I wouldn't have lived this way. I wouldn't have been wrapped up in this career and money making and that PhD degree and that degree. I would have given you all. If for one split second you could see what he's preparing for you in heaven. He would say, Lord, and I cling to this sin and to that habit and to this idol and I refuse to let go. Forgive me. If for one split second you could stand before his throne right now and see him face to face, your heart would stop. You couldn't take it. You would faint dead away. Jesus went with two requests to his father. He said, Father, I want that all those on that rebel planet who follow me, who love me, spend eternity with me, go wherever I go throughout the universe, never be separated from me. Could I have that? The father said, of course, son, I give you this. Father, I desire that they also whom thou hast given me may be with me where I am to behold my glory which thou hast given me in thy love for me before the foundation of the world. Father, I have a second request. When they do come, I would like to be everyone to be exactly like I am in character. No difference. I want to be their older brother. And the father said, I grant you that request too. For the Bible says, just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. The father granted every request of his son. Why? Jesus told us why when he was on earth. He said, this is why the father loves me, because I lay down my life. When Jesus, before anything was created, said, when this rebellion will happen, which he foresaw, then I want to be the one to reconcile the Godhead with humanity. May I? And it is then that what we call God the Father stepped back and said, and you shall have preeminence. You shall be the creator of all things. You shall be the intermediary between the whole universe and the Godhead. Yes, between heaven and hell, there is only one thing. The blood of Jesus Christ. The blood of Jesus Christ that cleansed me from all sin, that adopted me as a son when I wandered away for 34 years, coming to New York from Switzerland only for one purpose, to make a pile of money and to live it up. 
And my, did I live it up, because everything worked out just beautifully. I was picked up by a large pharmaceutical company, trained as an executive in one year. Every book was opened, every policy was described to me, every product was analyzed in front of me so I could understand it. And then I was sent out all over the world to open foreign markets for them. And I did live it up. Bars, theaters, the opera, girls. There wasn't a girl safe around me. That's the way I lived. But still, in spite of the fact that I wandered so far away from him, he kept loving me. He kept following me. He kept protecting me. Satan wanted to wipe me out many times. Each time, by his providence, he wasn't permitted to do. Because way there, I was adopted by him. He knew that one day I would fall in love with him. He, he knew one day I would lay aside the riches of this world. I would lay aside that bank account in Morgan Gary Trust Company. I would lay aside the title of president of five corporation and say, Lord, I want to proclaim your beautiful three angels message. The last message of mercy and love to mankind. That's all I want to do. Right there in New York. I don't like New York. It's dirty. It's filthy. It's dangerous. But there are 20 million people there. And that's where I want to be. Because Christ didn't die for trees and mountains like in Switzerland's gorgeous Alps. He died for people. And there they are, 20 million, black and white, who, who need him. Who long for him subconsciously. That's why they go all of these sex shows. That's why they, they take LSD. That's why they make money and drink. They are subconsciously so in need of Christ. There's such an emptiness in them. And what a joy to go around with your hands cupped like this and say, look at those diamonds, look at those emeralds, look at those rubies I have found, the unsearchable riches of Christ. And my, do they look. Like last night, I was with one of the wealthiest girls in Connecticut who tried to take her life on Thursday. Her parents called me, do something. And I went to the institution she was, and there she was in her Indian dress. Is there any hope for me? Chris, why did you want to do it? Because life had no purpose, Amelia, no purpose. And then after two hours, three hours, then the light comes in her eyes and says, I didn't know this. I wouldn't have done it if I'd known this. Or just Friday, just before I came to you, spending two hours with a lady who teaches all the top speakers from, from Santa the Hatfield down to Norman Vincent Peale how to give speeches and to tell her of the love of Christ. Going around New York and showing these people the unsearchable riches of Christ. That he has adopted each one of us. James Whitney, a prominent, prominent New York lawyer, had just left his limousine and was walking two blocks over to Wall Street when suddenly he felt a hand slipping in his back pocket. He quickly turned around, grabbed that hand. You want to rob me? The young man said, let me go, let me go. Don't turn me over to the police. I say, why did you want to rob me? Because I'm hungry. Mr. Whitney looked at him for a moment. Then he gently led him across the street, opened the door to a restaurant, sat him down, ordered a meal. The young man said, what are you doing? What are you doing? I just wanted to rob you out there. Never mind. Never mind, young man. Just eat. Just eat what I ordered. When you're finished, we'll talk. The young man eats feverishly, looking at the stranger, wondering what was in his mind. When he was finished, the lawyer pushed his chair back and said, Now tell me, young man, why on earth did you want to rob me out there on Wall Street? Sir, I just come out of jail. Six months ago, and I got out of jail. I tried to start a new life. I went up and down New York looking for a new job. I couldn't find one. The moment I heard I've been in jail these many years, I said, Go on, we don't want a guy like you. Sir, in that jail, I lost my good name. And what can a man do in New York without a name? The lawyer looked at him for a moment and he said, My name is James Whitney III. I've borne this name for 46 years. It's an excellent name. This name has never been put to shame. It's a clean name. I want to give you this name today. From this day on, your name is James Whitney IV. I want to adopt you. I want to give you another chance. I have only one request. Never bring shame on my name. Never. The young man, man was more frightened than before. He said, now wait a minute. Don't you know I'm a pickpocket? That's all I am. Yes, I know. I don't care. Your name from now on is James Whitney the Fourth. 
But come, you can't look like this. Looking for a job, I have to get your new suit, son. Come on. He took him out of the restaurant, took him over to a clothing store, bought him a beautiful new business suit. Then he said, I have a friend. He has a big corporation. He'll give you a job when I tell him that you are my adopted son. Come on, let's go. They went to see the friend. He received the job. And the two men were outside on Wall Street again. And Mr. Whitney said, son, remember, never bring shame on my name. Never. I have to go to Europe now. I don't know, I don't know when I'm going to be back. And he left him standing there. Paralyzed. Overcome what had happened to him. Mr. Whitney thought he was going to be in Europe for three years. It wasn't until 15 years until he returned. And he was having dinner in Central Park South in his fabulous apartment, reading the newspaper. The Wall Street Journal had an ad right on the front page saying, we welcome the great financier James Whitney III back in New York. When suddenly the bell rang. He went over to the door, opened it, took one look and said, I know who you are. You are that young man I adopted years ago. And the young man beaming said, yes, sir, I am that man. I came to welcome you, Mr. Whitney. I came to thank you that you gave me another chance. I came to thank you that you gave me your own name, that you got me that job. And I came to tell you that I kept your name clean. I've never dishonored your name, not once. And more, I'm a vice president of that company where you obtained that position for me. More, I'm a co-owner of that corporation. I came to thank you for giving me your name. Jesus says, He who overcomes, he who is victorious, I will make him a pillar in the sanctuary of my God. He shall never be put out of it. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which descends from my God out of heaven in my own new name. We are all children of the devil. There's contaminated blood streaming through our veins, contaminated with sin and with death. And what does God do? He writes his own name on us. His name is written right all over you. The whole universe watches you because his name is written on you. And you say to him, Lord, do you mean it? But look at my past. How can you do a thing like this? Give me your name. Look at my filthy past. And Jesus says, I died so I could give you my name. My friends, if you are sure that God's name is written on you, then live like it. Never dishonor him. Because Jesus says, I have only one request, that you never dishonor my name. So that when he returns, you can rush up to him and say, Sir, I kept your name clean. Nothing that I have done has dishonored your name. I'm a co-owner of your business on earth, the church. I'm a co-partner of your gospel. Thank you for trusting in me. Thank you for giving me your name. In 1953, after 34 years of that kind of life, Jesus wrote his name on Emilio Knackley. And I knew it. And when the airplane flew back from the Dominican Republic, where I found Christ through a Methodist missionary, and saw the skyscrapers of New York again, no longer did I think, how much money can I make on top of those skyscrapers? But how can I bring those people to know you, Lord, to fall in love with you? Give me only one gift. That's all I want. To help others to fall in love with you. And that's really the only gift I have. When the proper time had fully come, Paul said, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born subject to the regulations of the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive adoption as sons. And when I understood this, I said, Lord, from now on, I invest everything I am and everything I have in you and your church. Because you cannot be connected with Christ and not be connected with his church. The head and the body go together. Otherwise you have a monster. The two go together. I invest everything I am and have in you and your church. And when you pray like this, God takes you by your name. Instantly. He knew I had received a lot of money from this wealthy family to which I married. He brought people into my life that needed help, financial help. I wasn't looking for them. But the Lord kept bringing them, one after another, whole families. And my bank account, instead of going up, 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 which was, had been my goal up to that time, began to go down, down, down. Until I began buying my clothing at school fairs, 
second-hand clothing, paying ten, fifteen dollars a suit and two, three dollars for shoes, so I could give more. It was a joy to see that money invested in people who needed it, black and white, juvenile delinquents in Lower East Side. Then an artist family in Greenwich Village who were totally broke with a little baby, no, no furniture in the home, because he had such a miserable contract with a Hollywood artist for whom he was writing songs. He was bound, broke, needed help. How can you give the gospel and not pull out at the same time your wallet and say, I'll pay, pay your upkeep for the next six months, all right, until you get out of this contract? That's what Christianity is all about, doing the maximum for Christ every day. That's the joy. Just think of Mary Magdalene. She had been a prostitute. Worthy to be stoned to death. She was forgiven. Do you remember? She was in the upper room on Pentecost, Mary Magdalene. With the disciples. One of the honored ones. And I can just see those disciples walk toward Mary Magdalene and looking at her in amazement and saying, Mary, how fortunate you are. You washed his feet. You dry them with your hair. You poured an expensive ointment on his head. Remember when we had dinner with him in that room and you came into the back door and everyone was looking at you and you were not ashamed. You went right over him and broke that vial and poured it over him. And we remember still Jesus saying, she's anointing me for burial. Leave her alone. Because in us he saw hesitancy. He saw criticism because we said, what a waste. This money could have been given to the poor. Jesus said, leave her alone. She's doing all she can. Oh, how Jesus would have loved if we, his disciples, had anointed him. No, we had the spirit of Judas in us. We clung to money, good works. We didn't love him the way you loved him. You lavished everything on him. You did the maximum for him all the time. How much we would like to go back, back that year. Go back into that room. Not, we wouldn't let you do it. We would do it. We would anoint him. And how Jesus would love it if his disciples had the Holy Spirit working in them so they could see what hour it was. But you, Mary, you had that vision which we lacked. My friends, the day will come that Jesus will stand before you. You'll see his actual wounds. And in a flash, you remember what you withheld from him. The lack of surrender right now. The lack of doing the maximum for him right now. This gorgeous home that you lived in instead of selling it and living in a modest home. These fantastic salaries that you were pulling in so you could have your own airplane and three cars and go to Riviera on vacation instead of living a modest life and putting it all in Christ and his church and the world and the suffering. Me, me, me. Oh, when I look over at Adventist audience, I wonder how many are doing the maximum for Jesus. How many are building up their bank accounts and then that will all rot because when Jesus comes, it will all be swept away rather than investing it all in his kingdom now. You will, you will not be able to say, Lord, send me back. Put the clock back. I'll, I'll live differently now. The Lord says, too late. You should have done it then. Now is the time to do the maximum for Jesus Christ. To do all for him as Mary Magdalene did. We need an awakening. We need a reformation desperately. Just as those twelve disciples did. For three and a half years those twelve disciples were in the presence of this magnetic personality. And did not fall in love with him. Not until his resurrection did they realize who he was. And then gave all. Paul says, you know what a critical hour this is. How it is high time now for you to wake up out of your sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone. The day is almost here. Let us then fling away the deeds of darkness and put on the full armor of light. It's gay closing time. It's about over. Any year now, it's the end. The whole world is ready to be reaped. Babylon is filled with wrong teaching. Revivals are coming in this denomination. It's beautiful to see it. It's led by the Holy Spirit. I see it everywhere I go. Genuine revival. Total commitment to Christ. It's happening. God has given us some 
most spiritual leader in Brother Pearson. I wish he'd stay until the Lord returns. We couldn't have a better man. Filled with the Spirit of God. On his knees. Hours. Oh, I walked in once and I saw him there. And then he had a big pile of papers in front of him. And he said, you know what this is? My heart is burdened. I felt that he had ten tons on his shoulder. And he said to this friend of mine, I'm on my way to defend the spirit of prophecy to some of our own people. And tears were running down his cheeks. Elder Pearson is a deeply Christ-centered man. And he believes that this is one of the greatest gifts to this church. Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall shine upon you and give you light. Jesus prepared his disciples for revival in the 40 days after the resurrection. But then the disciples spent 10 days in the upper room, forgiving one another, becoming one loving fellowship, putting away all differences. The intellectual didn't look down on the dead when the one had not been educated. They were all the same, no barriers. And then the Holy Spirit fell on them. Pentecost. And then Peter went out with, filled with that spirit, preached. He had given many sermons before. But here he preached for ten minutes and three thousand people were converted. Filled to overflowing. There are degrees to which, with which you can be filled with the Holy Spirit. Little time with Christ, little oil in your lamp. Little Holy Spirit. Much time with Christ every day. Much oil in your lamps. Much Holy Spirit. Time with Christ. I spent three, four hours with the Lord. That's why everything is worn out that I own. Oh, they call me fanatic. They call, they, they call me a square. They call me many things. I don't care. A love relationship is that way that you want to be with your lover as much as possible. You even skip a meal if necessary or sleep. We don't need to sleep the way we do. We can sleep in heaven, you know. Now is the time to work. We long for revival. This is a command of God that revival must come to this denomination because the Lord is not going to call in the second remnant. There are two remnants. One inside the church. Not all Adventists are saved. Only a remnant inside. And the second remnant is outside. I know them. I know them. I'm with them all the time. I just returned from Israel with the Billy Graham team members, family members of Billy. And with their wealthiest supporters. We've been 10 days going up and down Israel. I was with 30, no, with 28 born again, deeply Christian men. Two didn't know Christ. And the Lord gave me the joy of leading these two men to Christ in the middle of those 10 days in Palestine. Men whose wives were there, Christians, have been praying for 20 years. And in Jerusalem, I took these two businessmen out. And they are pouring over the scripture. Both accept the Christ. But I've been with 28 men who have known, and women who, have, who, who live the way you and I live. My dad, even, they had no desserts, no coffee, no tea, no, no immoral story. Clean lives, holy lives. You should have heard them pray. Yes, the Lord has a second remnant outside of our denomination. He wants to bring the two remnants together. But he cannot do it until there's genuine warmth and love and holiness. In his house. When you invite guests, you clean it first, your house. You won't bring your house in a dirty home. The Lord is cleaning, shaking this denomination. And all those who refuse to be filled with his spirit and his love and his holiness, out. And their place is taken by a much larger group. Oh, I pray that none of you sift it out. Not one of you. But why does this church need to be revived? Don't they have all truth? What denomination has more truth than we do? None. There is some truth in every other denomination, but here is all truth for this age. So why do we need to be revived? Well, Jesus went one day to the house of Mary and Martha. The moment Martha saw him coming, she quickly dropped everything into the kitchen and began to work, work, work for him. While Mary simply walked over to him and sank to her knees and beheld his beauty and listened to him. Finally, Martha became so annoyed. She ran into the living room and said, Mary, you lazy so-and-so, get up. Come and work for him. There's so much work to be done. And Jesus looked at Martha lovingly and said, Martha, Martha, you're anxious and troubled about many things. One thing is needful. Mary has chosen the good portion which shall not be taken away from her. 
What was the difference between the two women? Martha had chosen the work and the service of God exclusively. Mary had chosen the person of God first. The first thing Jesus wants is that you fall in love with him. Have a relationship with him. Give him time. Give him of yourself. And then go into his work. Jesus said to the believers at Ephesus, I know you're enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake. And you have not grown weary. But I have this against you. That you have abandoned the love that you had at first. Now why did they abandon their first love, the Ephesians, the first church? Because their connection with Jesus had become looser and looser while they were working for him. Until it was broken. Christianity, believing, Adventism always was and always remains a personal connection with Christ. And not a bundle of beautiful doctrines. I love our doctrines. I nearly lost my family over accepting these beautiful doctrines. But before them comes the person. The incarnation of his doctrines. He took a hold of me. Broke me. I resigned. Gave myself up. He separated me from myself. And this is what many of us need tonight. You need to be separated from yourself. You're still your old ego. I know many who, after baptism, are exactly the same as before baptism. Arrogant, sensuous, materialistic, mean to others, tactless, rude. Their religion has done nothing for them. Why? Because they never surrendered their ego to Christ. They've never become lamb-like. Do you know what Jesus said of himself? In Psalms, I'm not a man, but a worm. Have you ever stepped on a worm? He just bleeds, rolls over, and dies. Have you ever stepped on a snake? It stands up, hisses, and puts its fangs into your leg. We can be religious snakes, repugnant to God and our fellow man. Oh, we know all the answers. We are super religious. We can lick anybody on the Sabbath question, on the state of the deck question. But we don't love. Our own children can't see Christ's love in their mother and father. So finally they throw up this religion. Say keep it to yourself. And they leave the church and Christ and all. And wallow in sin. And then we wonder why. Because we misrepresented Christ. Many of us Christians. Don't want to enter into a love relationship with Christ. We want to know the doctrinal aspects, the prophetic aspects. And we remain cold and indifferent all along. We don't want to have this romance with Jesus Christ. But I tell you, not until knowledge, faith and love for Jesus are blended together will ever anything great happen in your life. And your children find the Lord in your home. But no, we want to think, we want to we want to budget, we want to calculate everything, including the plan of salvation. But you see, love does not think, plan, budget, calculate. Love expresses itself on the spur of the moment. That's what Jesus is waiting for. Believing in Christ is a continuous romance with him that doesn't stop. Not these ups and downs. Sitting with him in heavenly places all the time. The Bible is never more than three feet away from you in any form. Maybe in this little pocket here. Just one book, the book of Thessalonians or Revelation. And every time you have a moment to watch, waiting for a bus or a subway, you pick it out and you read. You're constantly with him because we are a separate people. And unless you, you zero in your mind on his word and feed your soul, you will perish. Because Satan has 6,000 years of experience to brainwash you. He can lick any one of us. I don't care whether you're vice president of this denomination. It doesn't matter. He doesn't, position doesn't keep you from being brainwashed by Satan. Paul said, I have espoused you to one husband. That I might present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. And we don't want to be a chaste virgin for Christ. We don't want to be the bride of Christ. Last year, as finance chairman of Key 73 in New York City, I assembled 500 Protestant evangelical ministers in Fifth Avenue Presbyterian Church for a week revival meeting. I invited six of the finest speakers, including Senator Mark Hatfield, Dr. Ocken Gay, and many others, Dr. Kennedy from Florida. But before they started, I gave them my testimony. And as I spoke to them all, suddenly I realized that I was standing in the very spot 
where 20 years earlier I had knelt in marriage with my beautiful wife Anne. My thoughts went back and I saw that whole church, a Presbyterian church, covered with white lily. I saw my wife come through the middle aisle radiating. And then we knelt before Dr. Sutherland Bonnell and were married. But at the same time, my thoughts went back 2,000 years. When God came into our world and the first thing he did, he went to a marriage ceremony. Christ stopped every funeral, but he went to a marriage. Why? Because in marriage he saw the most beautiful symbol of the love relationship he desired with every one of the beings he had created. This is why he said, Therefore a man leaves his father and mother and cleaves to his wife and they become one flesh. And Paul explained it and said, This is a great mystery. I take it to mean Christ and the church. Sex is only known on this planet. Sex is not known anywhere else in the universe. On every other world and the millions of inhabited worlds according to the Bible. Millions. Every being is created individually like Adam was. Only here, Christ wanted to make a demonstration of the whole universe of the relationship he wanted with every one of them. And so he gave us the beautiful right of reproducing our own kind. He gave us sex. As a man and a woman become one body, one flesh in marriage. So Christ wants to become one body and flesh with you. Right now. Not when he returns. Not on the new earth. Now. Now, so we can say the purpose of life is to be married to Christ. There it is. Second Corinthians 11.2 I've espoused you to one husband that I might present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Isaiah 62.5 As the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. Hosea 2 I will betroth you to me forever. Yes, I will betroth you to me in righteousness, in justice, in steadfast love, and in mercy. And then you have this beautiful verse in Zephaniah 3.17. The Lord will rejoice over you with joy. In his love he will be silent. He will exalt over you with singing. This he will do on a new earth when we arrive there. This to me is a picture of two lovers meeting and sitting somewhere and looking into each other's eyes after having seen each other for a long time and they can't find words to express what they feel for one another and so they're silent. And this silence speaks more eloquently than 10,000 words and then he begins to sing to her, Place me like a seal upon your heart, like a seal upon your arm, for love is as mighty as death, as strong as the grave. His bolts are bolts of fire, furious flames. Many waters cannot quench love, no rivers overcome it. Do you have this love relationship? When I was finished preaching at Andrews University, students came and one especially grabbed me by my clothes and push me into a corner and say, give me this love. Show me how to find this love. I'm about to be ordained. I don't feel anything in my heart for him. Nothing. Help me. Yes, some people find this intimate love relationship with Christ early in their lives. My six children have it right now. Cliff, 19-year-old, wonderful student and athlete at Davidson College near Charlotte, North Carolina. Teaches Bible right there at Davidson. Weekends he preaches. I didn't ask him to. He wants to. He wants to be a, an evangelist. And the other, just three weeks ago, the, the president of our denomination went to, went to Davidson, called Cliff, said, would you like to come with me tomorrow on Sabbath and preach to 2,300 Adventists? And Cliff accepted and he gave his first sermon in an Adventist church. And then they had communion and he washed man's feet and he'd never done this beautiful thing he called me that night and my wife was on the phone. He said, I had a marvelous, the greatest experience of my life. I gave my testimony and then I communed and washed men's features like Jesus did. And my wife is very pleased. Stuart just accepted, was accepted three weeks ago at Princeton University. He wants to become a physician. Straight A, six foot four, tremendous basketball player. Every morning, before I get up, he already has his little lamp on and there he pours over the scripture and memorizes whole chapters. He wants to use the medical profession only for one thing, as to enter into the lives and homes of people to bring the gospel. He doesn't have money in mind at all. John is the same when Heidi, Grace, David, all the way down. Why? Because when there were still babies, I put my arm through the crib of, 
of their beds and held them in my arms and poured the love of Christ in them. I've been putting them to bed every night since they were born. That's my evening, putting my children to bed. I love piano, I love tennis, all this I had to give up. When I, when I have these children, I give myself totally to them. At seven o'clock, the two smallest go to bed. And I t- listen to them, they're all their hang-ups and their disappointments of the day, helping them gently to correct them, comfort them. Then I take them on my lap and read them an illustrated Bible. Then we go down knees and pray, and they pray with me. Then we sing, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Then we give them a memory verse. Right now we are in Colossians 3.16 and Joshua 1.18. Do not let the word of God depart from out of your mouth, but meditate upon it day and night. And the children say it after me until they know it. And then I turn the lights off. And then at 9 o'clock, I put the next two down and 11 o'clock the next two. Every night. Well, not those who are in college, but until they left. Every night. And they are in love with Christ. And some Christians find their, find this love relationship with Jesus late in their lives. Very late. Everywhere I go into our churches, some are falling in love with Him. Some have white hair. Some have been Adventists for 27 years. And then suddenly, they break and give themselves totally to Christ. And some Christians never find this love relationship. Never. That's a tragedy. Paul said, for God has allowed us to know the secret of his plan. And it is this. He purposes in his sovereign will that all human history shall be consummated in Christ. That everything that exists in heaven or in earth shall find its perfection and fulfillment in him. Christ is all and in all. For me to live is Christ. I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Let us rejoice and exalt and give him the glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and the bride has made herself ready. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. What does it mean, the bride has made herself ready? Where is the marriage supper? The marriage supper is investigative judgment. It's going on right now. When Jesus returns, he comes from the marriage supper. Are you ready? That is the question. And what does it mean to be ready? It means to be justified and to be sanctified. But many Adventists don't know the imputed and imparted righteousness from experience. They know it as a doctrine. But you can know it as a doctrine and go to hell. It has to be appropriated. All this beautiful knowledge that you receive from your pastors has to turn into surrender. The more you know of the love of God, the more it should lead you to repentance, the Bible says. The more knowledge of these beautiful gems of truth you receive, the more it's surrendered, abdicated you should be. But there has not been an abdication of self. Some leaders, some pastors, some laymen. There hasn't. You can feel it the moment you meet them. No surrender of the ego. Some of us love the doctrines, the commandments and the prophecies, but not the person of God. Paul was hated because he laid the axe at the root of the problem, on the ego, the death of self. Remember when Moses returned from Mount Sinai with the two tables of stone, with the Ten Commandments. He read them to the Jews. What did they say? We keep them, we'll keep them, we'll keep them. And a few days later they fell flat on their face and built the golden calf. Not realizing that no man can keep the law of God. Only as he allows to be put to death by God and then God invades him. It's an invasion. You drive down a highway, 60 miles an hour, and suddenly a man jumps into the highway and stops you. You come to a shrieking stop. And you say, all right, get in the back. I'll give you a ride. He just shakes his head. You say, all right, sit beside me in the front then. He just shakes his head. You say, what do you want? I want to sit where you sit, on the steering wheel. That's what Christ wants. He doesn't want to backseat or sit beside your partner or anything. He wants to take your place. You're dead. You're just a black suit. The Trinity lives in you and expresses itself to a dying world. And you don't care what happens to you. You don't care whether you live in New York City or in Africa or in the Amazon. You go where he sends you. And the same Jews who misunderstood At the time of Moses, what God asked from them made the same blunder when Jesus came into our world. 
He, they walked up to him and said, Lord, we fast. We are Abraham's children. Lord, we give tithe. Lord, we give alms. Lord, we keep the Sabbath. Lord, we are decent people. We are thoroughbreds. And Paul had to tell them Israel, pursuing a law of righteousness, did not arrive at that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as though it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone, just as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. And he who believes in him will not be disappointed. A whole nation ran against a large hidden rock and was smashed. And the pieces were scattered across the whole Roman Empire. And that rock was Jesus Christ. The Jews wanted the law of God, but not a relationship with God himself. Therefore Jesus said, whosoever shall fall on this shall be broken on this stone. But whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. Many Adventists want the doctrine, the theology, but not the person of God. I'm afraid that today 50% of our members are right now smashing against the hidden rock, Jesus Christ, and are perishing. perishing. Countless Adventists saying, his theology, yes, I love it. His person, no. No surrender to him. That's why it hurts me when people who, let's say, know me, walk by me as if they wouldn't see me. Look the other way. Or they do this to my dear, wonderful pastor. He's a small man. He was only 50 people. But he's a giant of the scripture. But some men just walk by him, turn the other way, won't even greet him. No love, cold, indifference, tactless, rude. That's not what Christ was. That's not what we just sang a moment ago. That's not this kindness. Jesus says, if I would bring now my other remnant into your church, they would leave immediately by the back door and never come back because they would say it was so cold in your church. This was Laodicea, impossible. It couldn't be Laodicea. Christ doesn't want to take such a risk, so he keeps them out. That's why Billy Graham is not an Adventist. It's not because he's stubborn. I talked to him about the sermon. I talked to him about the state of the dead, and suddenly Billy looks at me with that beautiful absolute transparent holiness is Emilio I can't understand it It, I have no light on it if I would I become Adventist tomorrow but I don't see it and then I shudder and I think that means only one thing we are not ready for him we are not ready for Bill Gothard we are not ready for Stacey Woods the head of InterVarsity with all of these men I'm working there is something that the Lord holds him still outside he's not ready yet Emilio wait I still have to clean up my house this rigidity, this hardness among, in many of our hearts has to go. Many of my people haven't been broken. They don't love the way I love, he says. When that comes, I will bring them all in because they're my children too. And Billy will sit and preach in our churches. That's the reason he's not one of us. And I think this day will come very shortly before the Lord returns. And it's going to happen quick, as Isaiah said, a day a nation shall be born. They'll come in maybe, I don't know, 30, 40, 50 million. And then persecution in the end. But in the meantime, the number one order of the Lord is revival and reformation. That we have put evangelism first. And that's our error. You cannot evangelize with people who are not broken on the rock of Christ. You can spend millions on TV show and everything you want. It will not work. It's just a trickle will come in. Revival is evangelizing our own people. When our own people have fallen in love with Christ and broken and surrendered all, you don't have to give them any program or method. They, they run to tell everybody what, that, what the Lord means to them. You can't stop them. If we have to push our people to do it, it means they don't know the Lord yet. They haven't been born again. They haven't been sanctified yet. That's why. Nobody could stop me after 1953, after finding Christ. I went boldly right into the big corporation in Squibb and told everybody from top to bottom about Christ. To the Rockefellers, everywhere, I just blurted it out. When your heart is full of something, it overflows. So I say the first work of our ministers and our whole leadership is to bring revival and reformation into our own church and then evangelism first comes Pentecost and then Peter preaches and 3,000 are converted but we have not put first things first there should be a department of revival and reformation in every conference in every union in a general conference with teams led by 
great men that we have, Maurice Venn and many others, teams going from church to church constantly among the 50 conferences and speaking to our people in such a way, such a beautiful way about Christ that they break, that their hearts break. And then they'll go out and these churches will be too small. You'll have to build new ones. But as long as we rely on Brother Vanden and Richard Fagel and the top men who are brilliant, it's too slow and it's too expensive. We'll be here for another 120 years. Jesus buried four Adventist generations because we refuse to do it his way. I don't want to be buried. That's why I came here tonight. That's what, I have a fire in my bones that drives me right across wherever I'm invited to speak about Christ, to speak about revival and reformation, to bring total surrender. That means 100%, not this 97%, which is repugnant to God. 98% holding on this and this and saying, Lord, all right, I'll give you tithes, I'll give you, keep the Sabbath, I, I believe the state of the dead and all this, but these two things, Lord, don't you dare to take them away from me. If you take those two things away from me, I'll give you up. That's what many do. No 100% abdication from self and ego. No death. You see, you can, you, you can become a leader and know all of these truths and never die to self. Satan stood beside the throne of God, beheld our beauty and the holiness of God and turned against him. And you know, uh, not only Satan can tempt you, you tempt yourself. Who tempted Satan? He tempted himself. You can tempt yourself. I declare war on myself every day. I said, Lord, separate me from Emilio Connectly. Totally. A new creature. You, you, the new man in me. And I've written in German shorthand on the first page all those hang-ups, character falls that I constantly discover. The closer I come to Christ, the more there are. And say, Lord, death to them, death to them. Separate me from them. And then it happens. When you accuse yourself like that every day before the throne of God, Jesus, now in the investigative judgment, says, I don't need to accuse Emilio. He's accusing himself. And he gives grace and power, because that's what grace is. Power to overcome. I don't even look in the mirror anymore. I used to look much too long. Now I realize every time I look in the mirror, I see the devil. <laughs> no vanity. It disturbs me when Adventists overdress. Some of our men dress more extravagantly than women. No, be modest all the way through. Keep your thoughts pure. The moment that filthy thoughts come with this sex-oriented advertising that is among us, you can't escape it, but don't take a second look. I walk, come from New Canaan down to New York, then I walk over to the New York Center, which is in the filthiest section, nothing but pornography all around me. I strain my eyes and say, if I have to look at something in order to cross the road, let me not take a second look. The first look you can't avoid, but the second look you can. Job made the covenant with his eyes, says, let my eyes not look at the virgin, lusting after. Adultery and sexual immorality is rampant among us, even in our universities, even homosexuality. It's all there. The world has invaded this church, rather than this church invaded the world. I know because they tell me, many, and they Claim victory, thank God. But of course, no revival can come under those conditions. He's going to bury us and our carcass is going to be just like the Jews in the 40 years in the wilderness. You and I will die and the young generation might finish the work if we don't give up every act of sin. You see, the righteousness of Christ is not just not murder, not stealing, not adultery. It goes all the way through whatever the Bible says and whatever the spirit of prophecy says. Every detail. You can lose your salvation on a small thing. The whole human race went to hell over an apple. You don't need to commit a great sin. If the prophet of God says no meat and you eat meat, you're a rebel. It would be dangerous to take you to heaven. Because it's not the size of your sin that counts. It's your heart. How do you respond to it? If the prophet says no tea, no wine, no this, and you go ahead and says I'll do it anyway... It would be risky to take you to heaven. You, be, you might become another Lucifer. And the Lord will protect the whole universe from a being like you. You'll stay here and perish. The righteousness of Christ includes everything you find in here and in here. Whatever the Holy Spirit tells you and what's not in these two. 
Because many new sins that, that Satan is inventing are not even covered here. But the Holy Spirit tells you. And if you turn him off, you grieve him, he'll depart from you, and you shall perish. The righteousness of Christ is 100%. The essence of true religion is a spiritual union with God going all the way. If the person of God is missing in our religion, or if he's not the center of our lives, immediately the human ego takes his place. And our religion becomes nothing more than a round of ceremonies and an adherence to a set of doctrines. Routine. And you see it all around you. Christians who go through the routine of praying. The routine of a worship service. Death. This can happen to us. It can happen to us, brethren. God gave the Jews the ceremonial law, the temple, the priests, the sacrifices, the feasts. For what purpose? To lead them to the Messiah. What did the Jews do? They made the temple, the priest, the sacrifice and the feast the very aim of salvation. They were only means of salvation. They were not the aim. But they said the temple, the temple, the temple. We have the temple, therefore God is with us. Nonsense, rubbish. We do the same. We say we have the state of death, we have Ellen G. White, we have all these doctrines, therefore God is with us. No! If you make these doctrines the aim of salvation, You've made the same blunder as the Jews. They are only means to the Messiah. Means to this union with Christ. Where everyone can see Christ in you. That when you love them with his love, they'll say, now I know who is waiting for me in heaven. It's a person who loves me like you, Jane. And I can hardly wait to be with him. That's what we are going to be used by the Lord Jesus. To create in other persons a longing, a thirst for God. The way we treat them. And and you may do this without even giving the Bible lesson. The way you treat them. In Taiwan was a young man Wu Long was his name. He was in the army very low down. Young man. His mother once told him in a few weeks you're going to be married. He was part of that Of a family that believed in the old Chinese tradition. That the parents choose the girl. But he could hardly wait for the day. The day came. He saw his wife carried in. All veiled. He had never seen her before. She bowed six times before him. Then he was permitted to go over her. And lift the veil over her face. And he shrank back in horror. The whole face was filled with pocket marks. Her eyes swollen. No eyebrows. Her nose, a deformity. He dropped the veil and ran into his mother's chamber and wept and wept. His mother came in and said, why do you do this? She is not beautiful, she is ugly. Mother said, you have to accept your fate, son. She may not be beautiful, but she has a beautiful soul. No, I want her face to be beautiful too. I can't be married to a girl like this. And he left for school and didn't come back for six months. Even in vacation he didn't want to come back. His father had to get him in college and bring him home. And as he walked in in into the kitchen, she was washing the dishes. She looked at him shyly for a moment, smiled and then bowed her head. He ran by her, didn't even look at her. Never shared a room with her. Another six months went by. Mother watched it on. Finally she couldn't take it anymore and she said, Son, you're unfair. She doesn't deserve to live like a widow. Look, ever since now, for a year, she's worked every day, 12 hours in the home, in the mill. Never a one word of complaint the way you treat her. Never a tear. Oh, I know she's weeping inside. Please, son. Finally, he gave in and shared a room with her. But he hated her. Never invited a friend. Never went with her anywhere. He wished her dead. They had a baby, a girl. She grew up, she was about 12 years old. When she was 12 years old, suddenly this young man, this father, went blind on one eye. Months later, he began to go blind on the other, went to a hospital and said, you have a very rare disease. You have to have a cornea transplant or you're going to go blind. It's going to cost a minimum of $500 and of course there's a long waiting list, you may go blind. He went home and said, $500, we don't even have that. She said, I'm willing, the wife said, to make, to make hats, straw hats in the evening. I want you to have that operation. I want you to see. Ah, but this long waiting list. 
One day he received, two weeks later he received a telephone call from the hospital. Come right away. A man had an accident. He gave his cornea to you. Come immediately. The operation would take in a few days. He took the wife's money that she had. She promised she would make some more money. He went to the hospital, had the operation. The bandages came off. The doctor said, can you see anything? He says, yes, I see a light. That's the lamp in the room. Success. In a few weeks, you can go home. In the next few days, he saw chairs, tables. He could count his fingers. And then the daughter came. She walked in the hospital room and said, we are so happy, Father, that the operation was successful. Could mother come to see you? No, I don't want to see mother. No, keep her out of this hospital. May I come and take you home in a few days? Yes, you can come, but not mother. After a few days, she came and took him home. On the way to the home, he said, when we are finished at home, I want to go to the cemetery and stand beside the grave of that man who gave me his cornea. She was strangely silent, the daughter. They walked into the home, and the wife just came out of the kitchen with a tray of his favorite food. When she saw him, she just said, you're home. And she bowed her head and began to weep. She, he said, thank you for giving me that money. Oh, she wept uncontrollably. She said, I haven't lived in vain. You thanked me. Never in 12 years had this man thanked his wife once for anything. But then suddenly the daughter began to weep and say, Mother, you've got to tell him. You have to tell him what you did for him. Tell him you gave him your cornea. He says, what? He rushed over to his wife and turned it around and looked into her eyes. And there was no cornea in her eye. It was blind. She said, he said, why did you do it? And he shook her. Why did you do that for me? And she said, because you're my husband. And she buried her face in his Showed. And he said, golden flower. For the first time in 12 years, he called her by her real name. Golden flower. Then he held her tight. And then he got down and knelt at her feet. Broken. To love with the love of Christ is the most expensive, the most daring thing you and I can do. Because it will cost us everything. If you don't love with that love, no one will be converted really. People want to see the love of Golgotha in you and me. I didn't learn this in the Bible. I learned it when my wife turned against me when I wanted to accept your beautiful truth and threw the food in front of me and said I should even feed a guy like you because she thought this was a heretical movement. Here I was a head of all the Protestant churches of the city of New York. It was an honorary title. A Presbyterian elder founded the wealthiest church in Connecticut. And here she said, you want to walk out on us and go into this little Adventist movement. I'm going to get rid of you. I'm going to strip you of everything you have, your money, your children, everything. And Jesus said, love her. Love her more than before. She needs to be loved more than ever. Kiss her every time you say goodbye to her. Kiss her when you come home, even if, she, if there's no plate where you sit. Whatever she does to you. When she cuts herself off physically from you, don't demand her. You don't need sex. I didn't have it either, Jesus said. You can live with me. Am I not sufficient? And I said, yes, Lord. I don't need anyone on earth or in heaven besides you. And I wept and said, Lord, give me grace. Give me grace. But the law gives you, when, when difficulties abound, grace abounds even more in your life. Suffering is an able tool in the, in the hand of a loving God to draw you closer and closer to you. He doesn't rejoice to when you see you weep in suffering and humiliation. No. He says in Hosea, I allure her into a wilderness to wipe her out. No, it says to speak tenderly to her. He allures you and me into the wilderness of suffering to speak tenderly to her. Because you and I are stubborn. We don't listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit. We are too busy. And so he strikes us in love. The test of your love is can you love someone genuinely? Genuinely. While he mistreats you. That is the test of your love. And it is then that the picture of Jesus begins to grow and grow and grow in you. He becomes all and in all. 
you certainly depend on him completely. Not on your wife, not on wealth, not on the church, on nobody but Christ. And your picture of Jesus grows and grows like in the suffering Saul of Tarsus who said, the Lord of glory, after his experience with him. In him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when yet by himself perched our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Paul, do you know more about him? He says, yes, I do. Listen to me, he says, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him and is before all things and by him all things consist. See how the knowledge of Jesus can grow in you until he fills all of you. You don't have another ambition left in you except to know him more each day, to become more like him each day and to make him known more each day. Those three. That's it. Paul said Christ is over all God blessed forever. What a vision of Jesus. Who being the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God. He stepped down, down, down. Here Paul attained the highest peak of understanding of Christ's nature. When he cried out, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever a scepter of righteousness, is a scepter of thy kingdom. And that all the angels of God worship him. He that descended is the same as he that ascended far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. The fullness of him fills all in all. See how Jesus can grow, grow. That's why Paul could speak so eloquently of the unsearchable riches of Christ, the unspeakable gift of God, the great love of Christ, the great mystery of godlessness, that God appeared in flesh. Is he growing like this in you? I begin to see more and more that only those who will ever make heaven who in this world find suffering, persecution, are driven like animals, go down, down, down to ultimate victory. That is the way of redemption. Not up, up, up. Down, down, down. Take Joseph. Joseph had these two beautiful visions. What happened? He was sold by his own brother down into Egypt. There everything went wrong. He landed in jail. Not for two years, for life. There in jail he could have said, Is that the way you fulfill your visions, God? I'm through with you. I don't take the suffering anymore. No, Joseph served everyone in jail there. He was beloved by everyone. And 24 hours later, suddenly, he was sitting as prime minister of the Egyptian empire. Down, 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 and then up to the throne. Same with Jesus. Jesus was equal with the Father. He stepped down once and became the Son of God. He stepped down voluntarily once more and became Michael the archangel and fought against the one third of angels that rebelled in heaven. He stepped out a third time and became man. He stepped out the fourth time and became sin, not sinful, sin for us. He stepped down the fifth time and went to the cross. It's a curse to hang on a cross, according to the Old Testament. He stepped down the sixth time and went into first death, which is unconscious. He stepped down the seventh and last time and went into second death, which is conscious. He tasted death for us. Second death is hell. Separation from God. It's the end of the road. It's the lowest place in the universe. Down, down, down from the throne of God into second death. No man ever came out alive as a second death. It's the end of the road. But Jesus was innocent. He came out and then ascended again to the throne of God and became a high priest, a mediator in glory. Glorious King of King and Lord of Lords. Down, 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 down and then up. That's the normal Christian life. Christ could not have chosen me to go out and preach until I went down into the gutter of suffering and humiliation. That small, that small he wants to make us first. He cannot make use you for any great task unless you're willing to be wiped out. Lose everything. Abraham, take your son Isaac and offer him a month, a month, Moriah. What an order for a father to sacrifice his son. It made no sense. Only heathen sacrificed people. The people of God, animals, made no sense. Abraham did it. Detached himself from the dearest thing on earth. And then he became the great leader of all the righteous. That's you and I. You're not chosen for a great preaching task. 
because you're educated, because you know the English language eloquently or anything, or your looks or anything. No, how much are you willing to give up for Christ? That's the test. That's the test. And the moment you shrink back, and you can, he'll never force you. He cannot use you for a great task. I say give up. Give up these idols that you're holding on to. Surrender all to him. Then the revival will come. Die to the ego daily. Set your alarm clock at five o'clock in the morning and then take your spirit of prophecy. That's what I do. I take the spirit of prophecy first. She gives me the appetite for the Bible because she, she writes so interestingly, so dramatically, filling in all the details that I've become fascinated and then turn to the scripture. And then I have a notebook and take everything down, learn one book like the book of Philippians. Every word of the book of Philippians, maybe two, three months, that I concentrate on Philippians until I know every word of it and memorize whole passages of the book of Philippians. And then I go on my knees and pray. And then I fast. Fasting is a tremendous discipline for the mind. When you overcome this appetite here, you will be able to control this. These two inches up here, which is the hardest part of man to control. So I fast, I give up all desserts. Unless I'm invited, then I don't want to insult the hostess, I eat it. But when I'm alone, I never touch anything. And on Sunday, I fast for a whole day. Why? I know I need it. I'm a weak person. I have to steal it just like muscle. I lift weights. Why? To keep in top shape. So I, I fast. To have total mind control. Because the battle of the 1970s over these two inches here. Mind control. Whoever controls your mind controls all of you. And I want Christ to control my mind. And this doesn't happen by accident. It has to be a disciplined way of life. Oh, my soul is burdened for many. In this room, I don't know you. Until Christ is formed in you. Are you willing? Are you willing? Are you willing to become like Jesus in such a way that gangsters are converted just by looking at you? Here was a gangster being nailed to the cross. He had heard many a sermon that suddenly looked over and saw Jesus being nailed. And the way he was nailed, the way he loved his enemies, the way he uttered, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. And this gangster was converted in a split second, just like Jim Voss out here on the West Coast when he met Billy Graham. Billy looked right through him and... Jim Voss was converted and is now in New York City helping other gangsters to find Christ. Or Stephen, the stones are flying through the air. Stephen covered with blood sank and said, Lord, do not lay this act to their charge. And Saul of Tarsus couldn't take his eyes off that man. He had never seen a man die like this. And on the road to Damascus, he was converted. And then he was chained to Roman centurions who dragged him through the streets of Rome. And I can just hear some of those centurions come back in the evening and say, I've had it. I don't want to be chained to that Christian anymore. I was chained four hours today. I kicked him about half a dozen times. I punched him. He never complained. He never uttered a bitter word. As a matter of fact, he, he gave me his food. Then he inquired about my old battle wound. I don't want to be chained to that Christian anymore. As a matter of fact, fellas, I think I want to become a Christian too. Do you have that effect on others? If you're touchy, my brethren... Quickly insulted and irritable when someone points out a failing of yours. If you make distinctions between important and unimportant people, between black and white people, poor and rich people. If you're ambitious and always push others aside, even in the church, so that you have preeminence. If you want to be loved more than to love others. If you want to be served more than to serve others. If you have no interest in the work of others, but only think of your own special work. If souls can suffer alongside in where your job is and you hardly notice, you're not interested in these people. If interruptions annoy you and the troubles of others make you impatient, all this means you are super religious. But you're not Christ-like and super religious. People crucify the Lord of glory. He doesn't want you to be religious. He wants you to be Christ-like. If something you're asked to do for another feels burdensome you, and you carefully avoid doing it, if you don't have the compassion on your fellow man as Christ the compassion on you. If you belittle those whom you are called to serve. Always talk of their weak points when you are around them. If you can easily discuss the shortcomings and the sins of any person. If you can write an unkind letter, speak an unkind word, think an unkind thought without grief and shame. If you bring up a confessed 
repented and forsaken sin of another person and allow your remembrance of that sin to color your thinking and feed your suspicions. If you don't have the patience of Jesus with your young people who may be fascinated by the world but you cut them down, you push them out of your home and your churches rather than put your arms around them and love them. If you can hurt another person's feeling by speaking up impatiently and unlovingly. If you always put the worst constructions of what others said or had done. If you think you must correct others sharply, harshly, disrespectfully. Yes, even your secretaries, your, your wives, you cut them down. Then you have not been broken on the rock of Christ. I was picked up on the airport not long ago by a man, a godly man, a pastor of one of our churches. And the moment he saw me come off the airport, he said, let's kneel and pray. And we knelt and I said to myself, my, what a godly man. He went in his car to his home 15 miles away. The moment we are, before we get in the door, he said, let's kneel and pray. That the Lord brought us safely here. And we knelt and prayed. And I said, what a godly man. We went inside after dinner. We held hands in a, in a circle. And we prayed again. And I said, my, what a godly man. Then he said to his wife, we we're going to have breakfast at 7 o'clock in the morning. I was ready at 7. He was ready. But breakfast was not ready at 7. He went into the kitchen. And I was standing right there. And he derided his wife in front of me. and said, you ruined my whole day. I told you 7 o'clock. Here is Mr. Knackley. He has all these speaking engagements and you haven't got the breakfast. No wonder everything goes wrong in my life. And for ten minutes he derided that this poor woman was pale and trembling. And I said to myself, those prayers he prayed the night before on the airport and all this was didn't go higher than six feet. God will not have our prayers if we refuse to love others with his love. That's phoniness. That's hypocrisy. It's fake religion. And God will have no part of it. No, you and I have to die to self and love our wives and our children first and then everyone else in church and in the world the way he loved us. Tactful, tactful. If you're not tactful, you're not loving because tactfulness is the first step of love. So lift your hands up to heaven and see, be my patience, Lord. Be my love. Be my peace. Be my purity. Express yourself through me. I die daily, always carrying in the body the death of him, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in my body. Two missionaries in the Congo had just come from a city back to their home station in the jungle with new clothes they had been purchasing, when suddenly, as they were driving with the jeep, a group of guerrillas jumped into the road and stopped the jeep. The guerrilla leader said, you, that the older man, we want to talk to you. Get off that jeep. This man had been about 48 years in the Congo. He took his Bible, went down and said, why did you stop our jeep? And the man said, because you're not cooperating with the revolutionary movement in this country. He said, well, we advocate a spiritual revolution, the Bible. Be quiet, old man. Throw that Bible into the dust. Stamp upon it, spit upon it, and swear that you're never going to open it again in this country. The old man lifted his trembling hand to heaven and said, as long as my Lord lives, I will never. They didn't finish, let him finish the sentence. The leader took this long, sharp manchette and cut the missionary's hand off at the wrist. And then he said to the others, finish him off. And they all stuck their manchette into his body and the man collapsed right there in the road. And the gorilla leader looked at the young man who was still aghast in the jeep. He, he was only about 26 years old. I just come to the Congo. Buddy, it's your turn now. Get off that jeep. He came down and said, well, what do you want me to do? Throw your Bible into the dirt here. Spit upon it and stamp upon it and swear that you're never going to open it again in this country. The young man took one look at this group of guerrillas. And he began to take his coat off. And he said, uh, you there, please take my coat. I just pay good money for it. It's a good coat. You get many years of good use out of it. It's no use splashing it with my blood and cutting it open with your knives. Please take it first. And they just gazed at him. And then he heard the guerrilla leader say, Men, we can't fight that. Let's go. And they dwindled away in the jungle, leaving the young missionary holding his new coat in his hand. The love of Christ, the love of Golgotha, that total abdication of self, that total peace in the front of death had made such an impression on those men that they didn't dare to touch him. That's it. That's the real thing. 
That's what Christ is waiting for. That's he wants you mothers to, to, to display that to your husbands, or your unconverted husbands, to your, to your children. That's what the Lord expects from me. And my wife just fell in love with me in Israel. That was the timing of the Lord after 10 years. Certainly in Israel. She said, I don't want to be further than a foot away from you. It was the greatest love scene I've ever seen. It hasn't stopped yet. And we were there in March. She finally saw the love of Christ. It took 10 years. My mother had to wait 40 years. Time is a test, my children. Time is a test. The Lord stretches out the answer to your prayers to test you, to insist to you, child, you still believe I can do it? And you must say, yes, I, I believe. He makes it a little harder. Child, you still believe I can give you the victory? Yes, Lord, you still can do it. And then he says, according to your faith, it shall be done. Endure. Don't grow bitter against Christ or the church. Remain faithful. Christ has not asked us to be successful, but faithful. Faithful. Please, John. Cleanse the camp tonight, as in the day of Achan, from the unfaithful and the thief. Remove the worldliness from you, as in the day of Jacob in Shechem. Cleanse yourself, for the Lord will do great wonders tomorrow, as in the day of Joshua at the banks of the Jordan. Blow the trumpet, because the terrible day of the Lord is near, as proclaimed by Joel. Look for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and prepare and purify for himself a peculiar people, zealous of good work. After Ezra and Nehemiah preached this way about the Lord, and the Jews listened, suddenly there was weeping, weeping left and right, not sentimentality, weeping over their condition. And revival swept over Israel. But 400 years later, Jesus, the Lord of glory, looked down from that hill, down on beautiful Jerusalem and the temple. And he wept because the Jews refused to weep over their spiritual condition. The question tonight is, who is going to weep tonight? Is it you or is it the Lord of glory over you? If you want this relationship and this abdication, this 100% abdication of the ego, this giving of all, then I'd like you to get out of your seat. Stand. Many of you come up here. I want to hold hand with you. I want to pray with you right now as we never prayed before. Come right now. Come right up here, close to me. I want to touch you. This has been another classic sermon from the Archive of American Christian Ministries. This recording has been digitally reprocessed from the original audio cassette or reel-to-reel -reel in order to make this CD available. The audio quality was improved as much as possible. International copyright, American Christian Ministries. All rights reserved. To order a copy of this or other presentations or for a free catalog, please call toll-free 800-233-4450. International calls dial 717-652-7000. You may also order from our secure website at www.americanchristianministries.org. There you will discover the largest selection of authentic Adventist preaching available. You can trust ACM. There is no compromise here. If American Christian Ministries has been a blessing to you, why not take a moment just now and send us a note or an email with your testimony? We'll share it with our speakers and volunteer workers to encourage them. Your prayers and continued financial support are very important to ensure the continuation of this ministry as we help prepare America and the world to meet Jesus Christ. He's coming soon. <laughs>